one of Newton's masterpieces is the Principia, clearly. Um, printed in 1687, this was a work that was to change the history of science, really. Uh, from the title, we understand that this work is devoted to the application of mathematics to natural philosophy, which were then Newton's mathematical tools in the Principia. There is not an easy answer to this question because Newton deployed a whole array of mathematical tools there. And uh, uh, it's um, difficult to identify, it's impossible actually, to identify one mathematical method that Newton followed in the Principia. In fact, in the Principia we find the method of first and last ratios from the very beginning, the method that Newton developed in the early 1680s. And uh, this is a method that allows him to deal very effectively with uh, some problems concerning central forces in the first three sections of the Principia. The problems in the first sections of the Principia, in the first, in the second and third section of the Principia, is the following. We are in void and we have a body that moves in void, attracted by a central force towards a center of force. And we know the trajectory that the body is traversing and we are asked something about the force, how the force varies with distance. So, for instance, if the body moves in a logarithmic spiral and the center, center of force is at the pole of this logarithmic spiral, then the force varies as the inverse cube of the distance. Or if the body moves along an elliptic trajectory and the center of force is in the center of the ellipse, then the force will be elastic. The force will vary directly with distance. So the distance doubles, the intensity of the force doubles. And of course, as we all know, if the body moves in a conic section and the force is directed towards a focus, then the force varies as the inverse of the square of the distance. And this is one of the main results in section 3. Now, in dealing with these things, Newton is not using algebra, is not using symbols, he is very successful in using geometrical reasonings that are based on his method of first and last ratios, because Newton has to calculate the ratio, the limit to which certain ratios of geometrical quantities tend when these quantities tend to zero uh, in the same instant. All right. So we have a ratio between a geometrical quantity at the numerator, so to speak, and another geometrical quantity at the denominator, if I may use this terminology. And then uh, these two magnitudes go to zero together in the same instant. They become zero. And we have to calculate the limit to which this ratio tends. And Newton, in calculating these limits, employs geometrical reasonings. But this is what Newton does in the first three sections of the Principia. After that, we find section 4 and 5. What do we find in section 4 and 5 of the Principia? We find <coughs> results on conic sections and other geometrical problems that Newton achieves via, I would say, a handling of classical properties of conics and via an understanding of certain propositions in projective geometry that he had uh, achieved uh, in the 70s. Now we are in section 6, 
And the first proposition of section 6 is a proposition in which clearly Newton is using an algebraic equation. So we are not in the field of geometry here. We are, uh, we, we, are we can see Newton employing algebra in order to solve that problem. And after that proposition, we find another proposition where Newton, in order to solve the so-called Kepler problem, uh, gives an account of the so-called newton raphson method, that is a method for approximating roots of equations. We move on, and we are in section 7 and 8. And what do we find in these sections? We find Newton dealing in very general terms with motion in, if you allow me an anachronistic terminology, motion in a central force field. So we have a body that is attracted by a central force and we are studying the motion of this body. Now, the propositions that Newton develops in section 7 and 8 in particular the proposition from 39 to 42 are propositions which begin with the following statement. Granting a method for squaring curvilinear figures, the following problem is solved. Concessis quadraturis uh, curvarum linearum. Uh, what does it mean? It means that the problem is solved if we know how to square a curve, if we know how to calculate the area of a curvilinear surface. So we can say in modern terms that in these propositions Newton reduces the problem uh, central force motion to a quadrature, to an integral. In the Principia, in the corollaries to these propositions, in, pa in particular in the corollaries to Proposition 41, Newton provides an answer to some of these problems that clearly depends upon, the perf upon an integral. So he performs an integration. He performs the quadrature of a curve, so to speak. So it's clear that in these propositions, what Newton does is to reveal he even states it in the statement of the proposition, uh, is to reveal that he is in possession of a method for squaring curves and that he solves these problems by reducing them to the quadrature of a curve. I could uh, continue with other sections of the Principia, um, but from what I have said, you can immediately perceive that what Newton is revealing in the Principia is a uh, very rich toolbox, so to speak. He has many methods, many mathematical methods, geometrical limits, projective geometry, uh, algebra, approximation techniques of al algebraic equations, integration techniques. So <laughs> we, we find that uh, in section 7 and 8, Newton uh, reduces some propositions, uh, some problems that he asks himself concerning central forces to a quadrature. And uh, in the corollaries, uh, I might draw your attention to corollary 3, proposition 41, he deals with a specific problem and solves it. And the specific problem is the following. What's the trajectory of a body that is fired in void and is attracted by a central force that, or repelled by a central force that varies as the inverse of the cube of the distance. That's a very interesting question. And uh, Newton provides an answer that uh, depends upon an integration, a quadrature, as he says, but he doesn't provide any uh, hint to the reader about how this quadrature can be performed. So we have a problem, we reduce it to an integration. The result of this integration is this, 
but I will not tell you how to do it. Now, Newton's readers were not happy. And uh, there were a bunch, a little bunch of mathematicians who could follow Newton's reasonings that were quite advanced for the age. And uh, one of these was David Gregory, the nephew of James Gregory. David Gregory began reading the Principia and wrote notes to the Principia that are very fascinating, I mean very detailed notes to the Principia. And when he arrives at Corollary 3 to Proposition 41, he doesn't know how to, to, to make sense of what Newton is doing. He knows the answer. The answer are certain spirals that the body uh, will trace when attracted by an inverse a, a force that varies as the inverse of the cube of the distance, but how could Newton get the answer? Now, uh, there is a letter by Newton to Gregory, uh, it, I think it's May 1694, in which Newton explains to Gregory how to do it, and what Newton does is the following. He says, let the force be denoted by f, let the distance be denoted by x. Let the velocity be denoted by v. He's using symbols, not geometry. And he writes what Newton calls a fluxional equation, what we would call a differential equation, and explains to Gregory how to square this equation, or in Leibnizian terms, how to integrate this differential equation and the result is what is printed in the Principia. Now this is one example. I could uh, provide other examples uh, with Roger Coates and other acolytes of Newton who approached him asking him questions concerning the Principia and we find that Newton in the 90s, in the 1690s, replies to these interested mathematicians by providing uh, details about the quadratures that are necessary or the integration that are necessary in order to prove these propositions. Now you might ask, ask me, but uh, so there is a hidden symbolic Principia written in the language of calculus? The answer is no. Uh, the propositions in which Newton makes recourse to quadratures are, uh, I don't know, the 10% of the Principia, perhaps, I don't know, I, I, I'm not able to, to uh, now to, to estimate it, but um, w what we have seen, what, what you can see uh, in the Principia when you see Newton using quadratures and explaining to his acolytes how quadratures can be used in order to uh, solve problems is not the rule, is one of, you know, is one of Newton's tools, let us say so. So, um, this is the first thing. The second thing is that, uh, compared to Euler, for instance, Newton's use of calculus, or Newton's use of the method of series and fluxions in the Principia, is sporadic, if I may say so. So, the structure is geometrical. At a certain point, Newton arrives at a step that requires uh, certain algebraic or calculus techniques, typically the integration of a differential equation, and he does it. Um, Euler is different. I mean, Euler, who was a student of Johann Bernoulli, begins from the beginning with the calculus. He states the basic laws of mechanics in calculus terms and everything is carried out in symbolic terms from top to down, so to speak, while Newton's use of calculus techniques in the Principia is subservient to geometry, so to speak. 